Hi friends, welcome to this video. In this video, I am going to discuss about cardiovascular system examination. Examination is a very important point in your exams because uh, in short case also you are going to examine, in long case also you are going to examine. So pay close attention. I have written all the important steps which you should carry out while doing an examination of a patient who is uh, labeled as cardiovascular system case. Right. So coming to general examination, I will discuss the proforma first, then I will discuss the individual components in detail. Okay, so coming to the general examination, patient is conscious oriented, right, height, how many centimeters you have to measure, weight and then BMI and you have to describe about the paler ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy and pedal edema. Vitals, you have to tell pulse is 80 per minute or uh, regular, high volume or no specific character. No radio radial or radio femoral delay, condition of the vessel wall is normal, all peripheral pulses felt. So while going through this, you will understand that we have to check the regularity, volume status. Okay, volume status can be indirectly given by the blood pressure measurement. So measure blood pressure accurately, right? Then condition of the vessel wall. Right, condition of the vessel wall is basically by palpating the vessels. Okay, and you can you have to roll, you have to roll the vessel and see whether it is collapsible or compressible and radio radial or radio femoral delay by comparing the pulses and then all the peripheral pulses you should know how to measure how to check the pulses okay right and if there is irregularly irregular rhythm in that case you have to check for this pulse deficit you have to uh, measure the heart rate and the pulse rate there will be difference for sure and that difference you have to mention as pulse deficit okay and blood pressure you have to measure in all four limbs very important Okay, and respiratory rate you have to write normal rhythm and abdominal thoracic type in case of males and thoracic abdominal type in females. And temperature you have to mention. So you should always have a thermometer. Okay, if the examiner asks whether you check temperature, you can say yes and you can show the term term thermometer as well. So, pickle and cardiovascular system, what are the relevance, clinical relevance? Yes. So, anemia can occur. Where do anemia can occur in cardiovascular system? So, anemia can occur in infective endocarditis okay and anemia can per se cause a congestive cardiac failure okay and ictus can occur in in once again right heart failure or a congestive heart failure what happens there is congestive um, hepatomegaly okay your uh, painful tender pulsatile liver can be there Okay, and that can happen in tricuspid regurgitation as well. So, patient has have an ischemic hepatitis. Okay, you remember nutmeg liver in pathology. Yes, chronic venous congestion. That can lead to heat stress. Okay, and cyanosis, cardiac failure will lead to peripheral cyanosis usually. Peripheral, peripheral cyanosis. Okay, why peripheral cyanosis? Because of the peripheral vasoconstriction in a poorly functioning heart. Whereas congenital cyanotic heart disease can cause a central cyanosis. Okay. And lymphadenopathy, there is not much uh, significance or relevance here. And pedal edema is very important. Okay. There are two types of pedal edema. One is a slow edema and fast edema. Okay. Slow edema takes more than one minute to recover back to the normal uh, skin. And if it disappears within less than if you are pitting the skin, okay, you have to pit, you have to give pressure behind the medial malleolus if it takes more than one minute one minute then it is due to your heart failure whereas less than 45 seconds can suggest a hypoproteinemia okay so these are the clues which you can get with the help of this pickle in cardiovascular system all right it's coming to jvp we have to know all in and you know in everything about jvp which will be discussed in a separate uh, module and you can check for the external markers of atherosclerosis. Basically, you can check for tendon, xanthoma, and preorbital region. There can be xanthelasma. Skin tax and acanthosis nigricans can be suggesting an insulin resistant state. Infective endocarditis. External markers can be anemia, jaundice, splinter hemorrhages, Osler's nodes, or Jane Way lesions. External markers of syphilis can be Argel Robertson pupil, alopecia, and gametas lesion. And external markers of congenital heart disease can be an abnormal facies. Okay. Uh, then uh, hypertelorism, low set ears and web neck. Okay, so web neck can be in Down syndrome. Okay, where do you get elfin phases in? Elfin phases in 
what supravalent aortic stenosis patients with elfin faces okay that is williams syndrome and uh, you can you should check for peripheral signs of aortic regurgitation okay that we can see in the separate module okay coming to the inspection inspection uh, chest wall appears symmetrical trachea appears to be in midline three points are very 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 important precardial bulge apical impulse and scars okay my professor used to teach me there are three points which you should check in inspection which includes jvp okay apical impulse and your uh, precardial bulge okay and three things he used to tell in palpation one is a thrill another is a heave another is a palpable p2 okay and three things in auscultation heart sound extra sounds and murmurs okay so these are the three three points which you can remember you should never forget okay and it is very very important for a patient whom you are examining as a cardiovascular case okay this is the performa complete performa so appears chest wall appears symmetrical trachea appears to be midline precardial bulge apical impulse kyphosis or scoliosis visible pulsation no other visible pulsation you can mention and dilated veins or scars so visible pulsations can be in aortic aneurysm or dilated pulmonary artery okay these are the conditions which can produce a visible pulsation in specific areas in the epigastrium it can be due to rv enlargement okay rvh okay sometimes due to a hepatic pulsation okay as well okay sometimes due to aortic pulsation okay patients with aortic aneurysm sometimes lean individuals there it can be normally visible as well and coming to palpation trachea can confirm to be it midline apex beat you have to mention apical impulse in inspection i for inspection and apex beat in palpation okay and parastinal heave palpable p2 no epigastric pulsation and no tenderness okay so the important things to be noted are apex beat of course apical impulse you are noting in the inspection so apex beat you will do it then thrill heave and palpable p2 these are the three important things which you should note in palpation coming to auscultation you have to go area wise from the mitral area then the lower left parastinal area that's also called as tricuspid area okay then uh, you can go to your uh, above that is uh, pulmonary area and to a right that is the second intercostal side left side second cross space left side is your pulmonary area and right side is your aortic area so we have to go in a sequence which is also called as inching method inch by inch you can move from the mitral area to the tricuspid area to the pulmonary area and to the aortic area okay so you have to mention like this first and second heart sounds are heard s1 is loud this is a case of mitral stenosis the classical description opening snap is present a low pitched rough rumbling mid diastolic murmur of grade 3 by 6 heard with the bell of the stethoscope in left lateral position when the breath held in end of expiration see the description it is very very important to describe the murmur properly that creates a good impression in the examiners and you are expected to explain each and everything okay and you can mention no other added sounds added sounds which include s3 or s4 then you can go to the lower left channel area so that is tricuspid area for once again you can mention the same first and second heart sound heard no murmurs or added sounds so what about percussion we did you discuss about percussion no did we discuss nothing why respiratory system percussion is mandatory whereas cardiac co cvs percussion is not mandatory it of course helps in identifying a pericardial effusion if there is discrepancy between the percussing the borders and the apex palpable apex beat it can tell you a pericardial effusion but percussion sometimes can lead to embolization that's what the theory is and so it is avoided okay pulmonary area again first and second heart sounds heard loud p2 is heard a to p2 split is narrow see this is very very important in pulmonary area when you describe about pulmonary area you have to always tell about the split without telling the split the pulmonary area auscultation is not over aortic area once again the same first and second heart sounds heard no murmur or added sounds second aortic area which is also called as herbs area okay herbs area very very important especially in patients with aortic regurgitation where the aortic regurgitation murmur the early diastolic murmur is best heard in herbs area okay so finally we will come to a diagnosis if you are examining as a long case you have to check for the other systems as well for example rs bilateral vesicular breath sounds no added sounds abdomen soft there is no organomegaly why organomegaly because hepatomegaly can be there in a patient with your uh, right heart failure right then cns you can tell no focal neurological deficit why cns because thrombus can be there right thrombus can be there in the heart which can embolize can lead to stroke okay so and um, paradoxical emboli 
can also be there from uh, DVT, you can go to the right heart, from uh, septal defects, ASD you can go to the left heart and go into the stomach circulation can lead to stroke. So these are the things which you should be adding in a patient with the, uh, if you are presenting as a long case. Whereas short case, you can just straight away go to the diagnosis, acquired rheumatic valvular heart disease, severe mitral stenosis, patient has sinus rhythm, patient has pulmonary hypertension, no features suggestive of congestive cardiac failure or infective endocrine. This is your complete diagnosis. Okay. So if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, you can mention here, patient is in atrial fibrillation. All right. So coming to the individual components. Okay. So about PELA, how will you examine PELA? So daylight, avoid the lower lay eyelids, ask the patient to look upwards, look at the palpable conjunctiva. Other sites include tongue, soft palate, palms and palmar creases. Nail beds lack diagnostic yield. Okay, but although we often check for nail beds, it lacks diagnostic yield. You have to comment as pale or present or absent. Okay, so if the palmar crease is pale, what does it tell you? It can, can, we, can we tell that the patient has this much hemoglobin after looking at the palmar crease, the palmar crease is pale as the surrounding skin, then the hemoglobin is less than 7 gram per deciliter. If the patient is having polycythemia, there will be flushed appearance. Okay. And if the polycythemia is uh, there, if the flushed appearance is there only in the head and neck, okay, then you can suspect a superior vena cava syndrome. Ictress, once again adequate lay daylight, ask the patient to look down, look at the sclera. The conventional teaching was bulbar conjunctiva, though it is not specific, basically sclera has a lot of elastin which has affinity towards the bilirubin, so you can pick easily. Okay, other areas to look are soft palate, palm and skin. Nectarus you can commit as present or absent. Okay, so that is a mnemonic LOG. Okay, so based on this LOG, we can classify whether it is a hemolytic or hepatic or obstructive. Okay, the light or a lemon yellow. It is lemon yellow, orange yellow and greenish yellow. Okay, so lemon yellow. Okay, then orange. Okay, then greenish yellow so these three tells whether lemon yellow it is it can be due to hemolytic and orange can be due to hepatic okay hepatic and greenish yellow it can be due to obstructive so how much should be the bilirubin to detect clinically it should be more than three milligram okay to become obvious and if a patient is having yellowish discoloration all over the skin except the sclera what will you think about it is the diagnosis is hyperkarotinemia. It can be due to excessive ingestion of carotene uh, containing vegetables, especially in a patient with impaired metabolism. For example, a hypothyroid patient who has impaired metabolism takes a lot of carotene, then it can lead to hyperkarotinemia. I can differentiate by looking at the sclera. Sclera, sclera will not be uh, a trick in a patient with carotinemia. All right. So next coming to clubbing. Uh, basically, you can view tangentially. See, take your finger, you just view. How is it? Okay, so tangential view or a shamrock sign. Okay, you can take your fingers, both of the fingers together and keep like this and check for your shamrock sign or you can elicit a fluctuation. Okay, so what is clubbing? Basically, it's a selective bulbous enlargement of the distal portion of the digits due to increased subangual connective tissue or soft tissue. So interphalangeal depth ratio is a thing which we can take for identifying. So basically, this area okay this area should be thinner than this area okay if it is this area is more thick okay more thick then it suggests clubbing okay and uh, the angle nail fold angle if more than 190 degrees okay this angle if more than 190 degrees is equal to clubbing okay and if shamrock window this window should be there okay if window is absent that is also equal to clubbing so these are the findings with which you can diagnose a clubbing. Okay, next this is the fluctuation test. Thumb should support the finger pulp. See, thumb is below the fingers, and uh, four fingers should elicit the fluctuation. See, four fingers is eliciting fluctuation, and the other finger will feel the transmission of the fluctuation. Okay, so thumb below the pulp, four fingers should elicit the fluctuation. All right. Look for widening and tenderness of ends of long bones. Uh, this diagnosis is hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. It can occur in malignancies. Okay, where the long bone ends also will become wider and tender to palpate. So okay, these are the conventional grading of clubbing, obliteration of angle between nail and nail bed, and positive fluctuation test, paradigmatic appearance, drumstick appearance, and hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. So grade one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is the conventional grading of clubbing. If clubbing is present, we can commit whether it is. Unidigital or pan-digital, 
okay unit digital means single finger or pan digital okay and uh, and grade also you have to mention okay so what are the causes of unilateral clubbing so one side only and we do aortic aneurysm brachial atrivenous fistula and your pan cause tumors okay and the most important theory behind clubbing is proven is platelet derived growth factor pdgf okay there are a lot of theories humoral theories there okay, and uh, but uh, the, this is the most accepted okay explanation for clubbing and what are the causes of unit digital clubbing can be your tophaceous gout or sarcoidosis or trauma so cyanosis how to examine cyanosis you have to ensure adequate daylight and sites to examine includes tongue oral mucosa lips cheeks ear lobes and tip of nose and hands and nail beds okay so you can commit cyanosis present or absent whether it is central or peripheral okay peripheral cyanosis only the extremities will be cyanosed okay so why we are checking the skin okay skin is thin and uh, in these areas only why these areas only because in these areas skin is thin and has numerous capillaries and uh, central cyanosis if a patient is having central cyanosis okay saturation will be less than 85 percentage okay if you give 100 percent oxygen okay if you give 100 percent oxygen central cyanosis will improve okay the sign the saturation will increase okay if you give 100 percent oxygen especially in a patient with central cyanosis but in peripheral cyanosis this will not happen okay and in peripheral cyanosis the saturation can improve after warming the extremities basically say peripheral cyanosis because of a vasoconstriction in a patient with shock okay so if you warm the extremities there will be vasodilation and the saturation will improve okay so now coming to the causes of central cyanosis decreased arterial oxygen saturation which can be due to high altitude okay that is hypoxia and high altitude and impaired pulmonary function like alveolar hyperventilation ventilation perfusion mismatch or impaired oxygen fusion anatomic shunts like cyanotic congenital heart disease pulmonary artery venous fistula and multiple small intrapulmonary shunts okay these are the causes of central cyanosis and remember hemoglobin abnormalities can also cause central cyanosis what are the hemoglobin abnormalities met hemoglobinemia met hemoglobinemia okay can uh, occur in certain poisons okay and uh, in that case what happens is the saturation will remain at 85 percent only and when you expose the blood if you take a blood sample and expose to oxygen it will be uh, turning to chocolate brown chocolate brown okay so this is a classical finding in met hemoglobinemia and the treatment of choice is methylene blue methylene blue okay we have uh, seen a lot of patients with methemoglobinemia due to poison ingestion okay and there are other conditions called self hemoglobinemia and carboxy hemoglobinemia carboxy hemoglobinemia can occur in smokers where also there also there can be decreased saturation so cause of peripheral cyanosis include reduced cardiac output cold exposure and redistribution of pulmonary blood flow to, uh, blood flow from the extremities so these are the causes of peripheral cyanosis so what is differential cyanosis okay so like upper limbs are absolutely normal there is no cyanosis but lower limbs is having cyanosis so what is the physiology in pda any idea so what happens is the pda is basically present in fetus ductus arteriosus is present in fetus which supplies which connects the iota to the pulmonary artery okay and uh, as soon as the baby is born it should close within uh, three days duration okay anatomical closure physiological closure is there if suppose the closure is not there okay there is continuous shunt initially the blood flows from the left side to right side okay even in asd vsd this only happens left side to right side and the pda connects iota to the pulmonary artery okay and blood flows from the uh, usually it will be after the subclavian okay your uh, right side common carotid is there your uh, um, left side subclavian is there after the subclavian then there will be your brachiocephalic is there then subclavian is there so, so after the subclavian there will be connection okay to the pulmonary artery to the iota so after these three okay this pulmonary artery will merge with the iota okay so this side your left side right side okay so there is a shunt this is the pda okay which connects the pulmonary artery to the iota initially iota's blood flow will come to this area okay there will be no cyanosis whereas when the pressure in the lungs increases the systemic circulation that condition is called as eisenmenger syndrome eisenmenger syndrome 
So when a patient's pulmonary circulation increases the pressure more than the systemic circulation, that is called Eisen Mangel syndrome. That will lead to right to left shunt. Okay. Initially was the left side of heart, the pure blood to the impure blood shunt was there. Okay, through the iota. But what happens later is there will be shunting from the right side to the left side. Okay. See. Later, what happens? The impure blood goes down. Okay. And above the pure blood is there, but it merges with the impure blood and going the uh, becomes the lower extremities become cyanosis. Okay, above pure blood is there, but it merges with the impure blood which is flowing because of the right to left shunt. Okay, so in that case, the lower extremities will be cyanosed. That is called differential cyanosis. Upper extremities are absolutely normal, whereas lower extremities are cyanosed. All right, where do you get intermittent cyanosis? Yes, where do you get intermittent cyanosis? Intermittent cyanosis can happen in Epstein's anomaly. Okay, Epstein's anomaly. Right, coming to lymphadenopathy, uh, lymphadenopathy, I'm not going in depth and it is not very important also, but uh, just to highlight and just to uh, revise your knowledge, I just uh, put the points. So, cervicofacial area and axillary area are important. Patients should comfortably approach the patient from behind, flex the neck forward, ask the patient to incline to the side of examination. For example, if you examine the right side, okay, then you have to incline towards this side. Whereas if you examine the left side, then you have to incline towards the, the page, ask the patient to incline towards the left side. Palpate for the lymph nodes on the same side, then occipital, posterior, auricular, preauricular. These are the different groups of nodes which you should check for. Where do you get short T lymph nodes? Yes, short T lymph nodes in syphilis, let's start like matter lymph nodes in tuberculosis and rubbery in lymphoma. So these are the characteristic points which you should know about lymphadenopathy. Okay, so how to approach the axillary lymph nodes? You have to approach from anteriorly, okay, from the front, right hand in the patient's left axilla and vice versa. Palpate the anterior axillary fold, palpate in the lateral axillary wall using your left hand for patient's left side. Okay, so right hand for the patient's left axilla. Okay, you have to take in you know, a hand from here and left axilla. But uh, when you want to palpate the left, a uh, lateral axillary wall, you have to use your left hand, uh, left hand for the patient's left side. Okay, and uh, what does this signify? Can anyone tell about this? What examination is going on here? This this picture. What is this? This is your epitrochlea. Epitrochlea. Okay, lymph node examination. What is this? This is very 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 important. Okay, especially in RS cases. Scalene lymph node, where you will insinuate your finger between the two heads of the standard mastite. Okay, two heads of the standard mastite, and you can check for nodes. Okay, it is uh, you know earlier to involve in tuberculosis. So scalene node examination is very important. Okay, so you go behind the patient, insinuate the finger between the two heads of the standard mastite, and after asking the patient to turn towards the side of examination. Okay, right? That's very important. So you have to compare the nodes with the contralateral side, assess the side size. Determine whether the node is fixed to a surrounding tissue or the skin. Check the consistency and check for tenderness. Okay. Next, coming to our topic, it's pedal edema. You can apply pressure with the help of thumb. Firm pressure should be applied for 5 to 30 seconds. Sides, you have to apply both sides behind the medial malleolus, sacrum, and malar bones. Okay, so medial malleolus is the most common site basically because when the patient is ambulant, the fluid gets accumulated in the lower limbs. Whereas if the patient is better done, you have to check for presacral edema. Okay, and you can also check for a malar bones. So above the malar prominences, if there is any edema, you can check. And you have to commit whether this is a pedal edema present or absent, pitting or non-pitting, and bilateral or unilateral. So how to demonstrate slight edema? You have to press on the skin on a bony area for 10 seconds with at least three fingers and slightly spread apart. You can see valleys. Okay, see if you press with three fingers, there will be slight elevation. So this you can check in a patient with slight edema. So as discussed, described already, slow versus fast edema, slow edema, pitting remains for more than one minute, it is equal to congestive cardiac failure, fast edema, pitting disappears less than 40 seconds or 45 seconds, it is almost due to low albumin level. So coming to BMI, this is the Asian cutoff for BMI, this is given on your McLeod's. Okay, so the formula is weight in kilogram divided by height in meter square, less than 18.5 is underweight, 18.5 to 22.9 is normal for Asians, okay, for Europeans or uh, like other population, it is up to 24.9 is normal, but for Asians, it is up to 22.9 and oh, this is overweight and uh, obese and morbidly obese, more than 30 is morbidly obese, okay. So, faces, abnormal faces, I would like to tell about mitral faces because mitral stenosis is a common case in our uh, exams that is the most most important or most common diagnosis as soon as you approach a cvs case the diagnosis will be mitral stenosis okay 
సో దిస్ ఇస్ దీస్ ఆర్ పింకిష్ పర్పుల్ ప్యాచెస్ ఆన్ చీక్స్ బేసికలీ డ్యూ లో కార్డియో కోపోటే మైడల్స్ నోసెస్ ప్రొడ్యూసెస్ వేస్ ఆఫ్ కన్స్ట్రిక్షన్ ఓకే అండ్ పెరిఫరల్ సైనోసెస్ ఆఫ్ సీన్ లిప్స్ టిప్స్ ఆఫ్ నోస్ ఇన్ చీక్స్ అండ్ అకేషనలీ విత్ దీస్ దర్ బి మేలార్ ఫ్లష్ బికాస్ ఆఫ్ వేస్ ఆఫ్ డైలేషన్ అండ్ మేలార్ మేలార్ ఏరియా ఓకే సో దిస్ ఇస్ దిస్ ఆర్ ద క్యారెక్టర్స్ అపియరెన్స్ ఆఫ్ మైట్రల్ ఫేసీస్ ఓకే నెక్స్ట్ మోస్ట్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ పాయింట్ ఫర్ ఎగ్జామినేషన్ ఇస్ యువర్ ప్రీ కార్డియల్ బల్జ్ యువర్ చెస్ట్ ఏసిమెట్రీ ఎవరింగ్ విల్ బీ డిస్కస్ ఇన్ ద రెస్పిరేటరీ ఎగ్జామినేషన్ వర్ ఎస్ ప్రీ కార్డియల్ బల్జ్ ఇస్ వెరీ వెరీ ఇంపార్టెంట్ so how will you examine for the precardial bulge patient should be in supine posture go to the foot end of the patient observe the chest wall at the level of chest wall so at the level of chest wall means you have to kneel or sit at the level of chest wall so if the chest wall is lying like this you have to see whether there is any elevation okay precardial bulge so just uh, i'm just showing you so if there is slight elevation okay in the left parasternal area then i'm i'm observing from the foot end of the patient okay then it is suggest a precardial bulge so precardial bulge means there is some problem in the heart which has happened even before the ossification and the ribs will ossify around 18 to 25 years so if there is precardial bulge then it indicates a long longer duration early onset cardiac illness okay right then apical impulse so i told already apical impulse is an inspectory finding so patient in cardiac bed nothing cardiac bed nothing but a uh, bed with reclined at uh, reclined at 45 degrees sternal angle that is the angle of louis corresponds to second intercostal space and you have to identify the visible pulsation below the left nipple try to approximately calculate the ics intercostal space and command okay basically in- impulse doesn't carry much uh, significance it's just an inspectory finding so you need not worry okay so basically the finger tips or the pulp of the fingers are usually uh, this pulp of the fingers is usually used for uh, palpating the pulsations okay whereas this area so this area is for your thrill okay the above the metacarpal phalangeal joints and this area the heel of your hand is for your heel parasternal heel okay so scars what are the scars which you can find in cardiology cases one is a midline stenotomy scar which can be due to a cavg that is coronary artery bypass surgery next uh, even in aortic valve replacement or any valve replacement surgeries this is the midline stenotomy scar is done okay and left submammary scar in case of mitral valvotomy this is all done in old old days now there is percutaneous balloon mitral valvotomy so pmvv so recently we are not using this uh, uh, incision the mitral valvotomy technique and infraclavicular scar can suggest a pacemaker or icd implantation that will be a bulge okay because the machine will be kept in the subcutaneous pocket so that can be visualized coming to apex beat what is apex beat very 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 important most lateral and inferior portion where the cardiac impulse can be felt most lateral and inferior portion where the cardiac impulse can be felt okay because there are a lot of pulsations which can be seen sometimes it can be prominent also but this, the apex beat is the most lateral and inferior okay and it is usually located in the left to fifth intercostal space at or medial to the you know mid clavicular line okay half an inch medial to the mid clavicular line so sometimes at the mid clavicular line can be and it is usually smaller than 2 cm or 0.8 inch in diameter moves quickly away from the fingers best appreciated at end expiration okay when the heart is close to the chest wall you have to count from the second intercostal space basically you have to keep one finger in the apex and then with the other other hand okay keep one hand in the you have to palpate the apex beat keep one finger exactly at the apex beat area and you have to uh, the, use the other hand for counting the intercostal spaces okay so when i was doing my post graduation i was uh, telling my professor that this apex beat is at the sixth intercostal space half an inch lateral to the mid clavicular line i was confidently telling so my teacher told you professor told you just uh, examine and show me how it is and uh, like uh, he wanted to verify okay he wanted to check what i did is i didn't palpate the apex beat when my professor was uh, seeing me i just started counting the intercostal spaces from above okay i got a good beating in my back okay so he told always you have to keep one hand in the apex beat and using the other hand you have to count the intercostal spaces otherwise you may get you know misled so that is very very important okay and uh, there is one important pulsation systolic retraction of apex beat systolic retraction which is also called as broad bent sign broad bent sign that happens in constrictive pericarditis okay and where do you get double apical impulse double or triple or quadruple okay so double apical impulse can be seen in lv aneurysm and hocm triple cadence or triple ripple 
Apex B it is seen in HOCM. Some people will call it quadruple also for HOCM. Okay, so triple cadence or triple triple apex B it is seen in HOCM. Okay, very very important is that the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. All right. So so place the right hand flat over the precardium to obtain the general impression of the cardiac impulse. Okay, so you have just take your hand your um, and then locate the apex beat by laying your fingers on the chest parallel to the rib spaces. If cannot be felt, ask the patient to roll onto the left side. Okay, identify the LV impulse when the breath held in expiration. First with the pads of several fingers, then you can localize with the tip of single finger. Okay, this is a, a mixture of uh, points from McLeod and Perloff. Okay, uh, so basically McLeod suggests that you can just examine in supine posture only in a 45 degree angulation. Then you can make them to turn if you are not able to get a proper apex beat. Okay, so what are the types of apex beat? Normal apex beat, you know, then tapping is there, heaving is there, hyperdynamic is there. Tapping apical impulse or apex beat is nothing but a palpable S1. It lasts very for very few duration, just, just hits and goes. This is what the conventional teaching is. It just hits and goes, hits and goes. Okay, that is tapping apex beat. Heaving and hyperdynamic, what are, what are the significance? Both in both the heaving, the timing is increased, okay, increased duration that will hit. Whereas hyperdynamic, it is normal duration. Amplitude will be increased in both heaving and hyperdynamic. Duration is more than two third of the systole, whereas hyperdynamic it is less than two third of the systole, and occupies only one intercostal space in heaving, whereas more than one intercostal space in hypertension circulation. The causes include pressure overload like aortic stenosis and hypertension, or volume overload uh, in hypertension circulation uh, like AR, MR, and VSD, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, and ventricular septal defect. Basically, volume overload conditions can produce a typical symptom called palpitation. Okay, and uh, these volume overload conditions can also produce a hyperdynamic circulation. Okay, usually left ventricle enlargement will lead to shifting of FX beat down and outwards. Okay, so LV enlargement, not LV height, this hypertrophy, LV enlargement, especially due to hyperdynamic, hyperdynamic circulation, can lead to shifting of FX beat down and out. Whereas right ventricle enlargement okay or rvh can lead to just shifting of the apex beat laterally okay there will be no downward shift but only laterally the apex beat will shift okay now coming to the next most important area that is thrill so patient in cardiac bed reclined at 30 degree or 45 degree angulation palpate with the palm or surface over the metacarpophalangeal joints so pulsations you will feel with the pulp of the finger okay thrills you will feel with them over the metacarpophalangeal joint and heels with the heel of your hand thrill if thrill is present you have to commit the murmurous more than or equal to grade 4. Okay, very, very, very important point. There should be a coincidence. Like uh, if you are telling committing thrill, then the murmur is more than or equal to grade 4. Okay. And what does, what else does thrill suggest? Thrill is nothing but a palpable murmur. Remember that. It is nothing but a palpable murmur. Okay. And thrill signifies that the problem is organic it is not functional it is organic in the valve there is in the mitral valve there is a murmur which you doubt whether it is organic or functional okay because even in mitral regurgitation there can be mid diastolic murmur it is you know you, you will feel how in mitral regurgitation only there will be pan systolic murmur you can think like that but in severe mitral regurgitation what happens is lot of blood will go into the left atrium and it again comes down during the diastole of the ventricle Okay, so that will produce large amount of blood is going into the left atrium and again it is coming down during the diastole that can produce a mid-diastolic murmur. Okay, but thrill can never be there. That is a functional murmur. Okay, whereas mitral stenosis thrill can be there, grade 4 can be there. Okay, and that thrill indicates that the murmur is from the valve problem. Okay, per se. It is because of the mitral stenosis like that. So the organic etiology can be, uh, you know, uh, conveyed by the thrill, presence of thrill. And parasternal heave, again patients cardiac but declined 30 degree angulation, heel of the hand, okay, that is, this is one concept, heel of the hand can be kept and pen, pen or pencil can be kept. If the like heave is very feeble, then you can keep a pen or pencil or three fingers in the second, third and fourth intercostal space. In the intercostal space, you can keep your second, third and fourth intercostal space, second, third, fourth intercostal, just keep it in intercostal space and feel, okay. Otherwise, some have suggested that. You can take the ulnar border, okay, your ulnar border you can keep in the parastinal area and check for the parastinal heel. Okay, next most important thing to be discussed is palpable P2, patient in supine posture, place your finger in the second intercostal space close to the sternum, palpable pulsation indicates palpable P2, okay. So what is shock? What is shock? Okay, so shock in cardiac, uh, your cardiac uh, 
palpation cardiac palpation is your palpable heart sounds okay palpable heart sounds so palpable heart sounds are called as shock okay um then so these are the parasonal heave grading grade 1 is visible but not palpable and grade 2 is visible palpable but obliterable if you compress the heave is not much okay and grade 3 is visible palpable but not obliterable okay grade 3 is severe parasonal heave parasonal heave usually occurs because of right ventricular hypertrophy sometimes it can be there due to left atrial enlargement also okay so coming to the heart sounds and murmurs you should know the areas of auscultation okay mitral area that is at the apex lower left sternal area which is also called as tricuspid area then pulmonary area aortic area second aortic area which is also called as aorta area which is third intercostal space left side close to the sternum carotids you have to check and axilla you have to check okay and always remember the rule is high pitched sounds okay high pitched sounds occur usually in high gradient for example aortic regurgitant murmur is high pitch aortic stenosis murmur is mixed frequency whereas aortic regurgitation murmur is high pitch because the gradient is more okay so this hd remember always remember hd okay you know hd high definition right so high frequency murmurs or sounds will be heard by the diaphragm of the stethoscope okay h for high frequency d for diaphragm whereas low frequency will be heard well with the help of bell of the stethoscope okay so very 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 important points and remember all the right sided heart sounds will increase with inspiration r i g h t the word itself is having the mnemonic r for right and i for inspiration okay so all the right sided heart sounds increase with inspiration except there is an exception which is often asked as mcq as well that is your pulmonary ejection click okay all others will increase with inspiration similarly left sided sounds l e f t the mnemonic is there l for left and e for expiration all the left sided sounds will increase with expiration okay so so regarding heart sounds you can comment on normal heart sounds first and second heart sound heard comment on the intensity okay whether it is loud s1 is loud uh, like that then you can comment about the additional heart sounds uh, s3 or s4 opening snap or ejection click you can tell whether it is present or absent then comment about the murmurs murmurs you can tell about the pitch quality respiration radiation site timing grade whether it is systolic or diastolic right any positional changes with what uh, of the stethoscope with the whether bell of the stethoscope or the diaphragm of the stethoscope you are auscultating so these are the things which you should comment in a patient who is having murmur okay so just to tell about the low pitch sounds and murmurs third heart sound fourth heart sound and mid diastolic murmur so these are the classical low pitch sounds and murmurs in cardiac auscultation and uh, high pitch sounds and murmurs are first heart sound second heart sound clicks snaps anything else okay which you can encounter is your high pitch sound and murmur and uh, so with this we have come to the conclusion so examination is very very important okay and in examination i would be highlighting some things in the uh, next module basically i didn't tell much about the okay pulse okay, and blood pressure okay then jvp okay and heart sounds and murmurs so these are the th things which are very very important okay you should have a understanding why they occur how they occur so i will be taking you to another module for discussing these things okay apart from that have a understanding how to examine the patient well okay remember always the gold standard is always stand in the right side of the patient okay remember if you are examining a female patient a female attender should be there a, a girl who is examining a male patient a male attender should be there these are the rules a golden rules should be followed sometimes in examination the staff nurse will come and stay with you when you are examining so and have a proper sequential idea of how to examine okay so that will help you to pick the diagnosis very easily so with this we have come to the conclusion thank you very much